Ontario Diagnostic Days 2022 on realagriculture.com is brought to you by the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, the University of Guelph Richtown Campus, Ontario Soil and Crop Improvement Association, Grain Farmers of Ontario, Agris Co-op, BSF Canada, Bear and DeKalb, Corteva and Pioneer, Great Lakes Grain, Mazex, The Mosaic Company, Pride Seeds, and Syngenta. Hi, I'm Bernard Tobin. Welcome to Ontario Diagnostic Days 2022. This year, Diagnostic Days were back in the field, but only at Ridgetown Campus, University of Guelph. Not everyone could attend those two field days, so this year we have a hybrid model of Diagnostic Days. This includes bringing you all the presentations virtually. We've recorded the session with each of the presenters, so we'll have four episodes for you in September, and we'll be publishing every Wednesday. We'll also have live and interactive sessions with the presenters on The Agronomists on October 17th and the 31st. We'll have plenty of crop diagnostic insights and opportunities for CEU credits in the weeks ahead. We'll have more info on the CEU credits at the end of the show. So let's get to episode one. We're going to kick things off with Real Agriculture's agronomist Peter Johnson and OMAFRA's acting cereal specialist Sophie Kolakowski. They'll discuss what we can learn from Ontario's last two winter wheat crops and how growers can set themselves up for success in 2023. We then move into a cover crop compendium with OMAFRA soil management specialist Ann Verhallen and University of Guelph crop technicians Chris McNaughton and Sean Bink. They'll discuss why it's important to have a cover crop plan. Everything from species to seeding rate to termination timing. Here's episode one. Peter Johnson at Wheat Pete here with Sophie Krolikowski. She's the cereals, acting cereal specialist with the Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. And we're at Diagnostic Days in Ridgetown. We're talking big wheat, baby. Like what else in the world is important? So you have to be excited with this session because it's the wheat session and there is no crop better than wheat. So what's really interesting is we're coming up to planting the 2023 crop, right? It's going to be the fall of 2022. We want to take what we've learned from the last two years and figure out how to set ourselves up for the very best wheat crop that we can grow in 2023. Exactly. So we start with our brand new program. It's only been out the gate for a couple of years. This is our second year in. Sophie, tell us about the Yen. Sure, thanks Peter. So the Yen or the Yield Enhancement Network project is, like Peter said, it's in its first full year. And it's a collaboration between OMAFRA, GFO, the University of Guelph, as well as some folks across the border in Michigan. So Michigan State University and the Michigan Wheat Program. So that's already very cool. Cross-border connections. So the idea behind the project or the goal is to create a network between industry growers, research scientists and extension specialists to close the gap between yield and yield potential. And also we want to kind of switch things up on their heads a little bit. We want to learn from farmers. We don't want researchers coming in telling farmers what to do. What we want to do is learn from the people who are, have high yields in Ontario and then how can we take those practices and turn them into best management decisions for the rest of the province and growing wheat? Absolutely. And as I mean, rule number one in extension is never argue with success. Well, this is what we're doing. We're looking at the successful wheat growers yep. and saying, how can we help other growers mirror what they're doing and get better at growing wheat? And by the way, yeah, not only cross border, but this next year, or this year rather, we have sign up in Kentucky, in Wisconsin, in New York State. Like talk about a broad geography exactly. and, and the fun stuff we're learning. So so what did we learn last year out of Yen, So Sure, yeah. So in the first year, what we learned was a few key points about how, like what the biggest factors are that contribute to high yields. So we have two factors. 
We have high heads per square meter count, and we also have a high total biomass. Right on. So high heads per square meter and biomass. Biomass. And so this is essentially the same things they talk about out of the yen in the UK. That's where this all started. But what we'd like to do now, because if we're going to set up for success in 2023, we should look at our, our historical data and say, okay, what can we learn? So Sophie, you look at 2022 and then I'll look at 2021 and let's talk about what happened. So the fall of 2022, or pardon me, when we planted the 2022 crop was actually the fall of 2021. What was it like? Sure, yeah, it was wet, Peter. So there were really only a few optimum seeding windows for growers pretty much all of October. Kind of out of luck, you were pushed into November. Yep, absolutely. So it was a it was tremendously backward wet fall. Now, we have to be careful because growers from other jurisdictions will watch this. It's not everywhere. When, this morning, like as we talked to groups, we did see that some of the growers in that Gray Peninsula, yep. Bruce Gray Peninsula, they said they had a pretty good fall, but for the most part, wet fall, 14 inches of rain in October in some areas, tile run wheat. In fact, in the fall, we sort of thought, are we even going to keep that wheat crop come the spring of 2022? What about 2021, Sophie? 2021, from what I heard, dry. Com kind of the complete opposite of what we saw in 2022. It was a great fall. You couldn't ask for better. We planted on time. It was warm. It was dry. It just unbelievably good conditions. And so we, we went into the fall or in, into the winter with a lawn, just a carpet of wheat plants out there. What happened in the spring, Sophie, 2022? 2022 in the spring, still a little bit wet, but then we transitioned to it being very dry. There was optimal conditions for people to go out and do these sorts of early fertilizer and also herbicide applications. Yeah, we got we got three or four days, right, of warm temperatures, kind of kickstart that, that crop. So a reasonably early start and then fairly dry and sort of optimal conditions from, from there at least until towards the end of May. Not too wet, wheat hates wet feet, by the way, this 22 or 14 inches in the fall, that's horrible. The spring of 2021, not that, not much difference. It was a, a decent start and it was fairly dry through the early going, like pretty decent com conditions to the point where this 2021 crop, oh my gosh, when I walked through it, it would trip me. It was just that thick. So now let's talk about grain fill. Sophie, 2022, what happened? We get to the 1st of June, the wheat crops heading out. What, what were conditions like? Sure, again, and people might argue it's regionally, but I think compared to last year, we had a longer grain fill period. We had cooler nights. There were a couple days where we were hitting 30 degrees in that June window, but overall, on average, temperatures were all right for grain fill. Yeah, so temperature's actually pretty good, right? And, and don't forget, 660 growing degree days that's Celsius for the people watching from the US. It's different in Funken, I mean Fahrenheit. So we have 660 growing degree days, not real hot temperatures, over 30 is bad. We're, we're not into that. But the difference, the real difference, nighttime temperatures. You didn't need air conditioning. Every night it went down to 8, 9, 10, 12 degrees. You open the windows, the house cools off, you sleep perfect. And so grain fill was really quite good. On the, the converse, in 2021, just brutally hot. High nighttime temperatures really cut down on that growing, uh, pardon me, on that grain fill period. We had 32 to 35 degree temperatures, even some over 35 degrees, which shuts wheat down. And nighttime temperatures, 18, 19, 20 Celsius. So the big difference, is actually grain fill, right? Exactly. So in 2022, we got what for grain fill, Sophie, roughly? Grain fill, I would say we're above 30, maybe mid 30 range. Yeah, so my data would say 35 to 37 days. And in 2021, we got 28 to 30 days of grain fill. So a big difference. Here's the other difference though. So in 2021, because we had this great fall and I was tripping through the crop, 
Lots of tillers. Lots of tillers, and we end up with massive head counts. So we actually end up with 120 heads per square foot. So that's massive. What about 2022, Sophie? What's Wasn't the difference? Wasn't as good. We had a significantly lower number. We had between 80 and 90 heads per square foot, Peter. Yep, and even some in between the tile runs as low as 50, right? Yep. So when you look at this and you say, so what matters, what we said right out the gate, what really matters is this biomass and heads per square meter. You'd look at this and say, well, gosh, I got to get more yield out of 120 heads per square meter than I'm ever going to get out of 80 or, or 70 heads per square foot. Like, wow. But in reality, what happens is that the yield is almost better in 2022 than it was in 2021 in many locations. And what that shows is that we really come down to this grain fill period having massive impact on what the final yield is. So now we look at this and we say, what can we do in, 20, in the fall of 2022 to set ourselves up for maximum yield in 2023? One last thing we forgot, Sophie, what about all these heads per square meter? What did that cause? Lodging. Right on. So we got lodging here. Did you have lodging in 2022? Not so far. A little patchy. Some areas overall looks good. Right so on. So far. All right. So enough about 2021, 2022. We need to focus in on 2023. So Sophie, help me out. We're going to go to 2023. And what am I going to do in 2023 to get great wheat? Sure, Peter, there's a couple things you want to look at. So was there weed pressure in your field? We saw a lot of grassy weeds in the wheat this year. So what can we do in, this, in the fall when we're planting? Burn down herbicide. Let's start with that. That's a good call. So the next thing we want to do as well is think about fertilizer. What's your baseline for phosphorus? Should we be applying a little bit more? And then Go ahead. Yeah, no, it's phosphorus, phosphorus, phosphorus. How many oh, times have you heard it. me talk about that? What? There's three nutrients that matter in the fall with wheat. It is phosphorus, 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 phosphorus. 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 Absolutely. Okay, so there's two. What else? Let's talk about seeding rate and seeding date. Those are very important as well. If we're talking about lodging, maybe talk about variety as well, if you have a history of that. Right on. So I think this is really the crux of the issue here. What we learned in 2021 wheat was we want high head count. But if we get high head count, we get lodging. What we learned in 2022 is that when you get a crappy fall, even when you use the right seed rate, what we would think is the right seed rate, dang it, you don't have enough heads. We, we really wanted more heads than that. So how do we manage that? I think you definitely can up your seeding rate a bit. The challenge is if you up your seeding rate, and you get into a fall like 2021 was, pardon me, like 2020 was, where we have really good growing conditions, then lodging becomes the issue. And the risk of increasing your seeding rate is that you end up needing two growth regulators. And by the way, growth regulators are not a silver bullet. Just because you use them twice doesn't mean the crop will stand. So go to, the, go to gocereals.ca, exactly. have a look at standability, know your standability, know that if you up your seeding rate that you are increasing the risk of lodging exactly but i do think that we don't want to short it too much and the last thing that that you did mention sophie but i didn't really focus in on this seeding date it's called early <laughs> early 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 always wins just no question about that right exactly peter yeah absolutely so there you have it Lots of great stuff from the Yen program. Lots of things to think about and apply for a great 2023 crop. Peter Johnson and Sophie Korolkowski, whatever you do, grow, grow great, great wheat. wheat. Hi, I'm Ann Verhollen, and today we're in Ridgetown as part of the Diagnostic Days for 2022. And today we're gonna to talk about Cover Crops Compendium all things cover crops. And I'm joined today with uh, Chris McNaughton, one of the technicians who does a lot of research for Dr. Darren Robinson, and Sean Vink, a uh, technician working for Dr. Laura Vaniard. And we'll hear from them in a minute, but first let's dig into a little bit about cover crops because right now 
uh, we're pretty heavy into the wheat harvest in amongst the rainstorms going through and it's a good time to revisit that cover crop plan or maybe you don't have a plan yet but the cover crop plan for after wheat harvest and it's important to have a plan that's interesting to note we've got a new program the on-farm climate action fund and it's going to fund cover crops but for that you need a plan so with this stop we're going to explore what it takes to make a cover crop plan so it's after wheat harvest what are we going to put in there well if we did red clover in the spring we're probably a little disappointed at this point all that dry weather and the hot temperatures have really played havoc with those poor little red clover seedlings. Although, don't give up. If we get some rains, some of it may come. But if you've got a red clover stand that's really not quite strong enough to make it through, uh, you can always patch it up with some other cover crops, things like peas or crimson clover or even red clover. Admittedly, it's not going to get very large, but then at least your nitrogen credit's a little bit more consistent. Okay, so now the other thing you might be a little short on is some forage. There's been a lot of hay that came out of production because of winter kill, or maybe just the dry weather has meant that you didn't get the cuts that you were hoping to get. After wheat offers an opportunity to get some forage in there, whether it's grazing or harvested forage like baleage. So our options there are things like oats, oats and peas. It's probably best to avoid the big multi-mixes that include a lot of radish just because they're really wet and they're not going to make good baleage. But oats can make some absolutely super feed. So one other thing to think about when you're looking at using cover crops for forage. When we plant a simple cover crop, we're using usually a fairly low seeding rate because we don't need to invest that money in that much seed and we don't necessarily need to feed it with fertilizer. But if you're going to use a cover crop for forage, that changes things. You've got to up your seeding rate to a forage rate and you need to feed that crop and treat it like a crop. So another use for cover crops and, and after wheat's a perfect time to get it in there is if we're looking to suppress some of these herbicide resistant weeds. You take a look out there and you can see a lot of wheat fields that still have some Canada flea bane escapes. Planting a cover crop after wheat harvest is a good way to reduce some of that going forward. And really any cover crop is going to help with suppressing some of these herbicide resistant weeds. There's been quite a bit of work done by Dr. Francois Tardif and Mike Cobra of Omafra looking at things like cereal rye and the ability to suppress some of our herbicide resistant weeds like Canada fleabane. So cereal rye is a wonderful cover crop to do some of that suppression and it fits really well after wheat harvest. And there's room after wheat for just a basic cover crop, something that's going to, yeah, it's going to suppress weeds, it's going to cover the soil, protect it over winter, feed the biology and build better soil structure. And it doesn't need to be complicated. Yes, you can do those large mixes, but even a simple oat cover crop or oats with peas, oats with radish, gives you a variety of root systems and lots of different exudates to feed the biology and build better soil structure. And any time we even have a light rate that can really help to keep that ground covered and healthier going into next year. So some of our experienced cover croppers are now starting to experiment with a thing called biostrips. And you may have heard about it. It's kind of a really interesting marriage between strip till, kind of, but using plants and cover crops. So in this case, we're using cover crops to create the strip. And Sean Vink here is one of the researchers or one of the technicians working with the researchers on some of the plots that University of Guelph is doing. So Sean, um, with these, these biostrips, what kind of species are you using between the row, the biostrip row and the inner row area? So in the biostrip row where the corn crop would go, we're using more annual cover crop species, stuff that will be winter killed. So your uh, radishes, uh, oats, uh, faba beans, and buckwheats. Um, then in between the biostrips, we're using uh, stuff that uh, won't be winter killed. So more, um, well, your cover crops won't be winter killed. So your vetches, perhaps, your uh, cereal rye, uh, maybe your kale, sunflowers, um, uh, cover crops like that. So have you encountered any problems in getting these plots set up as far as, like you've got two different totally different mixes that you're seeding there. So the, the first year we did it, we did it, we went over it twice for two plantings. Um, it worked 
okay, but then the last few years we're doing it with just one planning. It really all depends on what equipment you have and what it's set up for. Um, one thing that's very, very helpful is RTK, like GPS and driving, driving straight is very important. I can see that to be able to find the, the row for the next year. And have you changed the species at all? Like if you found ones that are working better? Uh, we, we haven't changed the species. Like we, we do multiple ones. So we're doing a whole, like we're, so far we've been using two uh, species in the bio strips. One with straight radish and then the one with the radish, oats, buckwheat, and um, faba. faba bean, thank you, uh, combined. Um, so far I find the radish by itself is pretty much a sure thing will be gone in the spring. Sometimes when you do with the other mixtures, depending, especially with the oats, depending on how big they get, like if they, if they get to be knee high, they don't really disappear come spring. They're, they're, they're dead, but they're still there. And it could be a, a problem come planting. Uh, faba beans pretty much disappear. Buckwheat will disappear too, but the problem with buckwheat is it goes to seed very quickly. So you will like, not likely, you might have volunteer buckwheat in your corn crop the following year. Yeah, that's a problem with buckwheat. It'll be flowering in four weeks and setting seed in six. So mm -hmm. I generally don't like it in mixes. But we'll talk about buckwheat some more once we start talking with Chris and the herbicides. Um, yeah, I can see why you really like the radish because the whole point of bio strips, right, is to have that bare strip for the next spring. Yeah, and one, one problem, potential problem with radish though is because if it gets too aggressive, it might actually go over into the the non-winter kill area and it might suppress those um, cover crops from coming up. So it might defeat that um, um, advantage. Yeah, and you're really planting that inter-row cover crop that's going to overwinter in order to, to do some value to reduce right. compaction yeah. Yeah. Or, yeah. or keep that ground covered, yeah. right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well... It'll be interesting to see the, the work as it goes on. So where are all these sites for the research that's being done? Um, so now we have, uh, it's a three-year trial. We have one site in Ridgetown, one site in New Lisgard, and one site in Winchester. Nice. That really covers yeah. the province really well. And on Ridgetown, we're doing it twice, one on sandy ground and one on heavier clay ground. Excellent. This will be exciting to see us. How many more years to the project? Uh, well, hopefully a lot more, but the initial project we're doing now, we're going into the last the cover crop planting this year and then the last corn planting next year. Some of the other locations got a head start. They might already be done this year. Okay, so last question, Sean. What about termination? You've got all these different mixes there. Does it change things? It, it does change things because you have your corn, where their corn's going, the species is already dead. You do have the option of spraying later on in the spring. It's not as necessary to go in early, especially with some like the, the Syrah rye that can get really big. You don't have to worry about killing it right away. You can let it grow and establish itself more and not have to worry about it affecting the corn crop because where the corn's going, it should be bare ground. Excellent. And that's usually the big challenge is all those cover crops, we need to kill them so early, we lose a lot of the benefit. Yes. That's great. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna wrap this session up with cover crop termination and Chris McNaughton, because uh, that's usually, I find, the last thing people think about when they're making a cover crop plan is they'll, they'll think about what they wanna grow and why, but the big problem is we gotta kill it in the end. So, Chris, I know you've got some opinions and thoughts about and some cautions. Yeah, um, definitely need to have how you're gonna get rid of that cover crop in the back of your mind. And how you're going to get rid of that cover crop is really going to depend a lot on what that cover crop is. So if you've got um, something like you've decided to put in annual ryegrass, um, you, it isn't always as easy to get rid of as you think it is. It's one of those ones where you can spray it with uh, glyphosate and you think you've got it, uh, but unfortunately it sets seeds really quickly so you tend to see it come back up in a secondary flush. So if you are putting in annual ryegrass and you're going to try and terminate it. That one's one where I would definitely be recommending that you put on the high rate of glyphosate. So you're looking at at least 1.67 liters per acre of glyphosate. And I would really like if you would mix it with a group one, so a grass herbicide, just to make sure you've got complete kill on it. You've got some other uh, cover crops like this lovely uh, buckwheat in front of us. It's a lot easier to kill. You can get 
rid of it with the lower rate of glyphosate, but you want to make sure your timing's right. If you look at the one that we have in front of us now, you can see it's got flowers on already, which means it's not going to be another, what, week or two before it's starting to set seeds. And then you've got buckwheat in your soil bank that you're going to be combating for year after year after year. So you want to make sure your timing on that herbicide is equally as thought out as what herbicide you're putting down. Yeah, so two things that I really wouldn't put in a mix, right? Annual ryegrass, because it's annual ryegrass, yep. <laughs> and buckwheat because it's going to set seed and it's going to be offset from everything else. Now, what about some years we have problems and when we have a mild winter, we end up with oats and radish that make it through or peas. Yep. Peas this spring where <laughs> they were there. Something that came through. What can I use to kill those come spring? So, again, those are things that you should be watching for. Knock on wood, they should be killed with a cold winter, but they're not always. So in the spring, go out, make sure either that they're dead and you don't need to worry about them. And if you're seeing them starting to grow and green up, then get ready to, for the most part, you can hit them with, with Roundup. But if I was, depending on what out crop I was going in, and I will say that, but I would hit it with Roundup and maybe a uh, group four. So your dicamba or 2,4-D, especially if you've got the tillage radish or you had some uh, clovers that you maybe didn't kill off the year before. So here's a tough one. I know there's a lot more interest and grow your own nitrogen for this coming year. So things like red clover, we're used to killing that one. Sometimes it can be hard. But what about hairy vetch? I see a lot more interest in hairy vetch because we are seeing good nitrogen production out of it. And it seems to be establishing reasonably well, even under dry conditions. So again, hairy vetch can be one of those tricky ones. If you're looking at hairy vetch for kill, Make sure you've got the high rate of glyphosate, so you're putting on at least that 1.67 liters per acre of glyphosate. And again, I would be tank mixing it with, with a group four just to make sure you've got that kill in there. Thanks, Chris. There's, you have so much knowledge about herbicides and it's not my skill set. So I, it's really glad that, you, that you've joined us today. So I think that really makes the point though, is if we're gonna grow a cover crop after wheat, we need to have a plan. And that plan should include not just the species, not just where it fits, and not just the seeding rate, but it should include the termination and any other management considerations. Whether there's, there's going to be a toxicity or an allelopathy or something like that going forward. Keep that in mind that you need a plan, if you, especially if you want to take part in that on-farm climate action fund and get some money towards planting a cover crop, you're going to need a plan. And Termination to me is one of the most important pieces of that plan. There you have it. I hope you've enjoyed episode one of 2022 Ontario Diagnostic Days. Again, CEU credits are available for Diagnostic Days. For this episode, you can send an email directly to Anne Verhallen with your name and CCA number, and she will submit your credit. You'll see that address right on your screen. Look for us next on September 14th when our topics will be how to manage soybean seed diseases and corn rootworm. We'll see you then. Diagnostic Days 2022 on realagriculture.com is brought to you by the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, the University of Guelph Richtown Campus, Ontario Soil and Crop Improvement Association, Grain Farmers of Ontario, Agris Co-op, BSF Canada, Bear and DeKalb, Corteva and Pioneer, Great Lakes Grain, Mazex, The Mosaic Company, Pride Seeds, 
and Syngenta.